Well, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon to, or good evening to the East Coast, where our guest is from. Uh, hopefully, all of you are able to follow us along. Thank you for those who are joining us here. Thanks to my students. This is actually a class for them. This is our Azores Literature and Culture class. And we're just uh, actually beginning to read a book that is uh, about the Azorian American experience, which is uh, by Alum Oliveira, I No Longer Like Chocolates. And so we, I thought before we began the discussion of that book and discussion of the Azorian American experience, I'd love to bring on uh, Scott Edward Anderson, who is our guest, as you can see there uh, on screen already, um, and uh, to the side, and of course his books there. So um, Scott has a very interesting uh, trajectory into the Azorian world. And I thought, as I've been tell, as with the students and I have been discussing since uh, we began class in August, so uh, for the last three plus months, that um, basically, or two plus months, I should say, almost three months, that um, Azorian American is something that it isn't just about the immigrant experience. It isn't just the son or the daughter of an immigrant or the grandson or the granddaughter of an immigrant. The Azorian spirit can be in third, fourth, fifth, and 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 so on generations. And um, and so the, I thought, what better way to introduce this topic to our students who are all joining us here um, on Zoom, and of course to some of the community members that are joining us, and those of you joining us through the Facebook Live and the different groups that are carrying on. What a wonderful way to talk about this Azorian American experience than through the eyes uh, uh, and the uh, and 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 of course the words uh, more importantly of a poet uh, Scott Edward Anderson and his talk is becoming Azorian American a diasporic journey and I as I think you'll see um, it is uh, it is in, it was indeed a journey it has been a journey it will continue to be a journey for all of us <laughs> even those of us who are immigrants but uh, uh, welcome Scott thank you so much for taking the time to be with our students and with our community as well we appreciate it uh, we you're one of our favorite guests to have on PVBI as you know uh, and we're glad to have you with our students especially Obrigado, Denise, uh, that, for that introduction and for the invitation. Um, and I must say, your support of me and my work has been an incredible gift for which I'm eternally grateful. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here with your students. I wish I could see them. I say hello to all of you. Um, and you may be asking yourself, well, Scott Edward Anderson, that doesn't sound like an Azorian name or a Portuguese name. And no, in fact, it's an Anglo-sounding surname. Uh, I'm the third generation Azorian American on my mother's side, um, but putting the words Azorian American next to my name is really a new experience for me uh, because I didn't grow up an Azorian American. Um, and um, I should explain that uh, I can make that go next. Yes, I can. OK, so two of my maternal great grandparents, um, Anna and Jose Rodrigues Kishkiu, emigrated from the Azores in 1906. Um, on the slide there, you see the gates um, that they passed through. Um, they weren't exactly in that position because they'd been moved um, in Ponta Delgada. Um, and then on the other, next to that is a postcard from around the time that they, um, that they emigrated, um, showing Ponta Delgada. The two ships here are actually the ships that they on which they left, uh, the SSS Romanic and the SSS Peninsular. Um, and uh, they left uh, within a month of each other. My great grandmother left with her entire family. Um, she had a sister, um, two brothers and her mother and father with her. And the painting that you see, it may be familiar with you, uh, um, Os Emigrantes, or The Immigrants, uh, by the great Azorian painter Domingos Rebello. Um, this painting has always, for me, um, symbolized the experience of my great-grandmother. Um, I didn't know my great-grandmother. Um, I never heard any stories from her or really not too much about her. Um, but I did through my 
ex exploration into the historical records uncover that she and her entire family uh, came um, together. And this is what it would have looked like uh, when they were leaving. I, I imagine the woman there with the headscarf and the, and the um, blanket around her is my great grandmother. She's sitting next to her father, my, my uh, you know, great, great grandfather. And then the little boy there in the blue um, shift uh, with the hat eating an orange um, is her younger brother, her little brother. Um, and they would have been around the ages that they're represented in this painting, even though this painting was was painted, uh, I think, like uh, probably 18 years later um, than they left. But it pretty much looked like that. And um, I, I can imagine that her big her big brother is hugging their mother and her big sister is there holding back her tears. And the 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 scene would have been a scene very familiar to many immigrants um, uh, th throughout that the immigrant experience in the Azores. Um, here are a few photos of my great grandparents. This, this is my great grandfather there, looking very dapper. I believe this was at my my mother's wedding. Um, he's got the boutonniere, um, very, very dapper. He was always very dapper, uh, from what I understand. He um, you can see him in the waistcoat there at Christmas time, uh, sitting next to my very elegant great grandmother. I've always heard that she was uh, impeccably dressed. She never went out without doing her hair and wearing the best clothes. And um, you see the photo in the middle there. <clears throat> this will become significant later uh, to me, um, my great grandfather on a horse or more likely a pony, uh, my my great grandfather, like my grandfather, was very small in stature, and so I suspect that that was not a full-grown horse that he's sitting on. Their son, my great grandfather—I mean, my grandfather, excuse me—is um, pictured there in these three photos in the middle, um, uh, looking very handsome in, in his military outfit. He was a, uh, um, uh, a, a um, Army Air Force pilot in World War II. And he was stationed just before the war down in Fort Blanding in Florida, um, which is where the two photographs that flank him were taken with my grandmother, uh, whom he married there um, just before the war. And um, you can see them posing uh, with, with my grandmother up on his shoulders. He was very athletic and... Um, I'll show you another photo here that I have. I don't have many photos of them. This is the whole, <coughs> excuse me, Rodriguez Kishkiu family in America. Uh, they changed their name um, to Perry. And for a very long time, I thought that their surname must have been Pereira, which was a natural uh, cognate to uh, or translation into uh, Perry. Very, very often that they, they took those names and just transmogrified them basically into English. But in this case, um, as I was doing my research, I couldn't find, I couldn't place the Pereiras uh, in the same household. I had an address, but I didn't have the, the name correct. And uh, ultimately I found out, I asked my aunt, wasn't there, was there another name that they went by? Because I just can't find anything in the census records indicating the, the Pereiras. And she said, well, there was this name, um, Casquela. And I thought to myself, well, that sounds Spanish, not Portuguese. So I thought maybe I was in a completely off track um, and was going to have to try to, you know, recreate uh, a whole family history in Spain. Um, but I remembered at some at one point that I saw in a, in a document the name Casquilia. Turned out that that document, I went through my files and I found that document. It was actually when my great grandfather was applying for citizenship. Um, whoever typed the card uh, for the citizenship typed, typed out the name Casquilia and he had crossed it out and wrote Perry. <laughs> and so I went back to that and I said, okay, Cas Casquela, Casquilia, what could this be? So I did a search on Portuguese surnames. I didn't find any 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 
Keshkwela uh, or Keskilia, but I did find Keshkiyo, Keshkilio, or Kesh Keshkilia in some cases. Turns out that that was a nickname that eventually became a surname. And so that unlocked a whole a slew of, of documents and information. Once I had that correct, I could look it up basically just by doing C-A-S-Q because the name had been butchered in every single document by whoever was was transcribing or whoever was was he was dictating to. Uh, they never got it right. Um, so but I did find out that, in fact, my great my grandfather was born Edward Keshkiu <laughs> in Providence. And so here he is with his with his parents. And you can see very elegant mother. And uh, again, with the waistcoat, very dapper father, his his brother Raymond is seated there. And then his sister um, is, is standing behind them. And um, uh, they had another brother who unfortunately died um, at a very early, a very young age. He was only 18 when he died. Um, and um, uh, there was some mystery around his death, but I think it had, I think it had to do with water on the brain. Um, but this is this was the family after that period. So my my great grand my grandfather, um, as I said, had been a pilot during World War II. When he was ten years old, they lived in East Providence, and he walked down to the Metacomet Country Club in East Providence and got a job as a caddy, and that completely unlocked his future. He later became a golfer. He was taken under the wing of, uh, of a member and became the first Portuguese member of the Metacomet Country Club, although he didn't acknowledge himself as Portuguese. He wanted to be American. He didn't want to have anything to do with the history, with the past. He wanted to be American. He was proud of being an American. There was a story about how whenever he started a, a golf tournament, he would have a, a portable record player and he would play the national anthem and he'd have his hand over his heart, and in the other hand, he had a clear drink, some sort of drink cocktail or something like that for the national anthem. So he be, he became a member of that club. Uh, I had the letter in which they introduced, they, they welcomed him into the club in 1940. And then he became term, term president of that club years later. He was also the head of the Rhode Island Golf Association for 33 years. He received the Frank Lanning Award, which is this is the award as it as it's it's a very large um, uh, illustration. It appeared in the Providence Journal, but it was also a, a very big award that he received. And I saw it in his house uh, for, for the, every time we went there. Yeah, this was an award for the most outstanding contribution to sports in Rhode Island. He received this in, I think, 1971. And there's little stories all around here. Uh, as you can say, uh, as you can see, that um, tell illustrate different aspects of of, of his personality uh, and his life as people as as people remembered it to Frank Lanning, the artist and illustrator of that um, uh, of that piece. Um, and in two thousand one, he was elected to the Rhode Island Golf Hall of Fame seven years after his death. All this to say, he was a very successful American. And he once said that for him, he was afraid that being Portuguese would prevent rather than promote opportunity. And he was probably right, because at the time that he was a young man, so he was born in 1915, so he's coming up in the 20s and 30s. And at the time, even the Portuguese American Civic Society produced a flyer, a little brochure that said across the front of it, if you want to be a good Portuguese, become an American with a big exclamation point. So that's what he did. And he, he even though we lived in, in East Providence, an Azorian American stronghold like Fall River or the Central Valley of California, he distanced himself from the community. And we never, consequently, we never grew up with the any of the festas, or we had a, a few of the foods. We had uh, linguiça, we had um, Portuguese sweet bread, masa cevada. We had a few things, but nothing really. Um, my grandmother tried to learn recipes from her mother-in-law, but her mother-in-law always left something out and it never worked out. So, <laughs> which I gather is a common Portuguese mother mother-in-law trait. <laughs> um, so we never 
we didn't grow up with it. Uh, my my grandfather only spoke Portuguese with his parents. He never taught the language to my mother or her siblings. Um, and so the year, it was around the year I turned 30, I decided I really wanted to learn the family history uh, on that side of the family. So, and I got interested. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit of how I got interested in that family history in a minute. But I started to learn Portuguese. I'll be a Brazilian Portuguese with a teacher. Um, and uh, they had a 78th birthday party for, for my grandfather. Um, and I went up to him and I spoke to him in Portuguese. And he was, nobody spoke to him in Portuguese, certainly not from my generation. Um, and he only, like I said, he only spoke Portuguese with his parents. So he was really kind of taken aback. Um, but then he also he looked at me with a certain fondness and he put his hand on my shoulder and um, he 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 looked pleased. And I thought, OK, I'm going to I'm going to get the family history from him. And I said I said, I want to know um, where I came from. Who am I? You know, I want to know your I want to know the family history. He promised to do it, to tell me the stories. <clears throat> but um I, I I wasn't able to stay around and, and get the story. My my aunt promised to get the story from him. But when she tried, he dismissed her and said, no, this is my story. He doesn't need it. Uh, you know, I'm not doing it. And then he died. What I didn't realize was that the reason we were having a, a 78th birthday party was because he wasn't going to live to his 80th. 80th would have been a more natural, uh, you know, birthday to recognize. So he he took the entire family history with him to the grave, and it was it was very distressing, very sad. Um, I really kind of gave up learning the family history after that because I'd hit a dead end. It would have been really impossible for me to find information uh, with so few resources available, um, with no kind of firsthand accounts. He didn't have a diary. Or he didn't have. Yeah, I didn't find records among his among his papers. Um, and then my life got in the way. I, I moved to Alaska. I worked with the Nature Conservancy. I had a son. I got busy in my working career for the next quarter century. I really didn't think about it again um, until my father died. And my father was a very stubborn Scotch-Irish American. He died in, in 2016. And I come to find out, actually, my my father was mostly Irish. He had three... He had, um, uh, three Irish grandparents and one from Scotland. And I'm not quite sure whether that one from Scotland wasn't originally from Ireland also, but that is where my surname came from. Um, and he was a big of a, a bit of a bigot, uh, really. Uh, um, um, uh, intolerant, I think is how the Portuguese might say it. He looked down on others, especially the Irish and the Portuguese, uh, which was not uncommon in Southern New England at the time in the early, uh, in the 1960s and early, early 1970s. Um, with the Irish, it was probably a little bit of self-loathing on his part. And for the Portuguese, it was probably most likely an essential conflict with his father-in-law, uh, Mewavo. He, because I looked more like my father's side of the family, the Azorian side, uh, my father picked on me. Uh, he called me Portuguese or worse, pork and cheese. He would just, you know, this terrible, tell these terrible stories about the Portuguese. Always read, whenever somebody was getting into trouble, who was Portuguese, he would read read me, read me that article to, to me out loud from the newspaper, make sure, you know, I, I was kind of ashamed of it. Um, my skin was darker, uh, olive colored, and and uh, my hair was darker then. Um, <laughs> and if he intended to make me feel ashamed about it, it, it worked, it worked. And I tried to hide it away. And this kind of dual denial by my grandfather and a denigration by my father, uh, really took its toll on me for, for years. Um, but then prior to my starting to learn Portuguese and getting an interest and going to my, my grandfather, um, I was rummaging through the stacks of poetry books in, in the alcove in the old Gotham Book Mart in Manhattan, which is a, was a wonderful old bookshop on 46th Street. And in this alcove, they had stacks and stacks of, of books, just chock-a-block, no, no, in a random order. And if you, if you went through them, you might come across a, a, a gem. And in fact, I did. Um, this book it's a translation, the William Atkinson translation of the Lusiads, which I still have uh, here today. I should have pulled it off the shelf and I probably should could 
grab it, but it's over here somewhere. Um, anyway, uh, but that's the that's it, and um, it's Luis de Camões' uh, epic poem of the great Portuguese navigators. It tells the story of Vasco da Gama, and it's it's it was first published in 1572, uh, and is considered the greatest one of the greatest epic poems of the Renaissance. I had first read about this book in Ezra Pound, who was an American modernist poet, 20th century, a uh, book of criticism that he wrote called The Spirit of Romance. And I thought to myself, Portuguese epic? What? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> and um, so I read this translation. It was a prose translation, which doesn't entirely do the poem justice. I've since read of several different translations of the uh, of the poem in, in poem, uh, poetic form. It reads more like a history book uh, than poetry, but it was exactly what I needed at the time. Like growing up, I, you know, I couldn't recall hearing about the Portuguese explorers in school. We, it was all it was all about Columbus, 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 Columbus. He's an Italian who, although he was funded by Spanish Queen Isabella, he was trained as a sailor in Portugal. But we never learned any of that. You know, he discovered America, so it was all about Columbus. We didn't have it was very little mention, if any, of Magellan, Vasco da Gama, or Prince Henry the Navigator. Um, and so, you know, if the Portuguese were discussed at all, they were, they were exploiters and ex not explorers, you know? So it was, a, it was, it was kind of, again, that sort of like shame and sort of, but here I am confronted with this incredible heritage and thinking to myself, well, this is something I should be proud of. Now, of course, there are aspects of the colonialism and slavery about which I shouldn't be proud. But at the time I was reading this, I hadn't known about this incredible, uh, these journeys around the world uh, and and all the places that were that were discovered um, discovered um, by the Portuguese. Um, and later in the year of my grandfather's death, um, I started to learn about more modern poets, Portuguese poets like Fernando Pessoa, pictured here with the hat and the mustache, and Nuno Judic, who's in the top photo there, and and Pedro Tamen. Those two came to New York um, in 1994 with the translator Richard Zenith. And I met them at Poets House in New York, actual living, breathing Portuguese poets. I couldn't believe it. You know, like what, what are the odds? And they read their poems in Portuguese and then Richard would read them in English. And it was a language that sounded quite different from what I was learning in the Brazilian Portuguese. There was a musical darkness, a brooding, wonderful sound quality to this language that they were speaking and the poetry that they were that they were reading. And I was enchanted. Um, but like I said, it wasn't until my father uh, died uh, two, two decades later that I began to think seriously about trying to understand my full heritage, uh, not just the Scottish and Irish side, but also the English side, and finally the Portuguese, and more specifically, my Azorianity. So I began to research the family history, mostly online, which was in 2016, kind of a minor miracle, although because there were new newly available resources like Ancestry.com, that was a Portuguese archive called Tombo, uh, uh, .pt, and an Azorian genealogy list serve, which still exists on Google and um, uh, I think in, uh, in, in some other forms as well, um, where people were helping each other out with the research and uh, we're, we're translating documents for each other or identifying names, trying to make connections across generations, clarify their family tree, uh, determine who was who. And as I began to go deep into this research, I realized its importance to me as a person because for most of my life, I had lived with this enormous gap in my heart, not knowing. It was an emptiness, you know, not knowing uh, that side of my of my family heritage. Uh, it was really kind of a missing link for me. So the deeper I dug, the deeper I found my roots in the Azores, and in particular in the island of San Miguel, um, that were deep and rich. And they went back to the early settlement days. And all over the island, from the from the northwesternmost point, Britannia, to the southeasternmost point, uh, Pavosao, or from Javier Grande in the north to Sahok in the in the south, and I found out that one major branch of the family tree came from uh, from to the Azores from the Alentejo in the south central part of mainland Portugal, and another part, another branch uh, came from Viseu in the north. 
So I started to bring all of this stuff together and uh, it was really, really um, uh, moving. Um, well, at least one of those ancestors shows up in Gaspar Fruccioso Sadas de Terra. His name was Fernal Afonso uh, de Paiva. Uh, he later went by the name Fernal de Fonsu, um, either out of respect for a nobleman who had the same name as his given as his, his original name, or because he was in hiding uh, from the authorities for an infamous crime back on the continent. Nevertheless, he went to Madeira first, where he met and married uh, Beatrice Pierce Delgado, who was 10 years younger and hailed from the Delgados of Ponto del Sol. Um, he didn't stay long in Madeira, however, because he had a servant with him who presumably was lent to him by his, his wealthy brother, um, who returned to the mainland. And according to Fru uh, Fruccioso's account, he felt persecuted uh, by the relatives of the dead uh, person in this crime. Um, and so they fled to the Azores and they settled in Juragan, um, which was then a backcountry village uh, and where he could be more hidden and, 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 and escape. Um, but he became a prominent landowner across the northern coast of the island. This was fascinating history to me. I mean, I had no idea of any of this, you know, so I'm reading this and digging deeper. And then I thought, I really need to go there. I need to go there. I need to see it for myself. I need to I need to feel it. I need to touch the soil. I need to see where where this side of the family came from. So I went to the source for the first time in 2018. It seems to me like it was a long time ago now, but it feels it's only five years. Um, and really, when I when I landed on the Azores, that's when I became an Azorian American for the first time. Really, really, really felt it. So I went to San Miguel in the summer of 2018 as part of a residency with Disquiet International. I had I was given 10 days to write, conduct research in the archives and explore the island. And when I landed in the airport in Ponte Legata, I immediately felt at home. It was a strange, physical, visceral feeling like I'd been there before. And I mean, I've, I, I didn't couldn't quite put my finger on it, um, I, but I felt it in my body. It was a very, very profound feeling. It was hard to ignore and hard to dismiss. Um, and it was really, I feel like my DNA was connecting to the island. It was sort of resonating with me in that way as a, sort of Saudad, the term Saudad. Um, uh, uh, Esmeralda Cabral, dear friend of mine and a wonderful writer herself, um, calls it an intergenerational Saudad uh, that's, that's passed on um, through the generations. And um, so here are some photos. This was the the cohort of, of disquiet um, fellows and uh, uh, residents. And then Vembertu um, Freitas, uh, Michael Spring, who is in the photo in the lower corner there, the uh, gentleman with the other, the other gentleman with the beard, um, was the other Asorian American uh, uh, resident at the time. And Brendan Bowles in the black shirt there invited us to lunch with Vembertu Freitas. And I didn't realize until later, because Vembertu was a, is the is the sort of the 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 renowned and um really authoritative voice of, of, of literary criticism in the Azores. And I didn't realize that at the time, but the reason Brendan was introducing us is because we were Azorian American. I thought it was he was just being nice. But um Vembertu later uh had a copy of my book my first book fellow field in which i have a poem called sadad which also appears in in into the azorian sea in, in indonesia's anthology um and he read from that in this um uh presentation uh and he said he proclaimed it as a a, a um an, an example of the next generation of azorian american poetry and i i must say i was really taken aback i was it was really moving uh to have someone recognize me uh, as an Azorian American poet for the first time in that in that way and in a public forum. Um, later on in Lisbon, I had a reunion with Nuno Judic, who I hadn't seen in twenty well, quarter century. Basically, uh, we had dinner with him. Uh, there's the photo in the lower right hand corner, uh, which was also remarkable. Why did it take me so long to get there? That was the that was the question. That's uh, sort of the fifty thousand dollar, fifty million dollar question. <laughs> that you know, I, I was almost fifty six years old when I first went there, um, and I feel like I wish I had gone earlier. 
Um, but you know, I had a, I went to a lot of places around the world, uh, before I got there. So maybe it was sort of like Odysseus's long protracted journey home, a necessary journey, because I'm definitely a different person than I was when I was 20, when I was 30 or even 40 years ago. Um, you know, it's, um, uh, you know, hindsight is 2020, right. But I, all I can, all I can do now is, is enjoy, uh, the time that I have to go there, uh, at this point. Um, so that was one discovery of, of an aspect of my identity. Another aspect of my identity that has been with me, well, for much longer, as Denisha alluded to, as, is that of a poet. I've been writing poetry since the age of nine. I got serious about it when I was a teenager. I published some chapbooks. Those are the books in the top center photo there. Um, and was part of the literary scene in, in New York City in my 20s. I won a few awards, but I didn't publish my first full-length uh, book until around my 50th birthday. That's the book in the bottom center, Fellow Field. Um, I had a, I had another, I had another life. I was, uh, uh, I, and I hadn't really, I hadn't really completely um, identified as a writer or as a poet. I had, a, I was, I, I was, I was also a businessman. I worked in conservation uh, for for many years, and then in clean technology. Uh, I was a, a, a spokesperson on uh, on Fox Business, um, which is the photo in the lower right hand corner there. And you know, so at the time that I was discover rediscovering my Azorian roots, I was also embracing my the poet self, my poet identity. And concurrently, I was letting go of an old identity. Um, built on a 25 year career in environmental protection and clean energy. I remember vividly the day that uh, my last full-time job uh, th that I left in New York, I walked out of Times Square, off the offices there of my employer, and I had to just hand it over my keys and my identity badge. And as a poet, that metaphor uh, of that second item, my identity badge wasn't lost on me. Um, and then, um, you know, it was from that point on that I decided I was going to really embrace my writing self, my writing life, and try to make my way as a writer, as a teacher, and as a translator. Um, so I had these two aspects, two streams, if you will, uh, maybe lava flows coming together, the Azorian American aspect and the poet in me coming together. And when they came together, it was like a volcano. <laughs> it was like a volcano. I mean, it has. I um, I have. Uh, I've published four books in the last five years. I've been to the Azores seven times in the last five years. Uh, I started translating um, uh, Vitorino Nemazio and Pedro da Severa and some other others as well. I won an award in. The Azores for this book, Falling Up, was a, a memoir of second chances. It's a Letra Shlavadish and, uh, and, and a Penn Azores Award in 2020. And then my I had two books published in Portuguese. Uh, first, my bilingual book-length poem, Azorian Suite, um, was published by Letra Slavadish um, in, in, in 2020. And then last fall, uh, Margarita Valdegato's um, translation of my book, Dwelling, an eco-poem, was published in Lisbon as Habitar. Uh, and I can just feel my great grandparents and my ancestors behind me over, looking over my shoulder, just marveling. Uh, first of all, that I could, you know, write in English because they probably couldn't, but <laughs> but that um that I had this work and that I was completing this kind of circle uh back with them. Um and I also have have continued, like I said, to, to translate, but also to try to, uh, to 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 learn the language. And I a lot of that was because I had to try to decipher the official documents. Um, the parish, the parishes in the Azores kept all the marriage, baptismal records, deaths, and et cetera. And then the inventarios, which are sort of uh, household uh, inventories. Uh, prior to a will or in, in lieu of a will, um, we're in this incredibly beautiful script, as you can see from the cover of that inventario. 
Um, and I don't know if you can see, I can't, I don't know if I can zoom in on the slide there now. I guess I can't. Um, oh, there I can. So this is, this is the baptismal record of my great grandmother and Anna. And there, that's, it starts there on that lower um, corner there. Uh, and then it goes into her family history. It goes into her, who her parents were and where they were from and what have you. It continues on, this, on the next page. And um, this is the, my great grandfather's um, uh, application for his passport. It's on uh, the line uh, there. This is Jose Bradbish Keshkiu. Uh, it has a sponsor. Uh, and it goes into his, it's, it's his passport application. So um, really amazing stuff. Uh, but I've had, you know, I've had to like be able to decipher this. But what helped me in this regard was that was poetry, because like poetry, these documents are, are written in a certain fixed pattern. Um, they have repeating phrases, they have repeating forms, and which once deciphered, you can really unlock a lot of the clues and the, and, and and read them, uh, even though they're very ornate in this beautiful, beautiful script. Um, so. On this quest for my identity, uh, my true identity, uh, if you will, um, in the latter part of the, the last decade, um, which led me back to poetry, my first love, and to discover my deep roots in the Azores and the combination of the two. And like I said, now I'm often identified in circles, even here tonight, as an Azorian American poet or a Luso American writer, uh, which has been truly remarkable. And it fills me with pride rather than shame um helping me heal from the harsh words of my father uh and my grandfather's neglect of his heritage and legacy and it's changed my writing life my life and overall uh, my work my purpose um as i've said many times it's like a constant series of waves that have brought me back to those rocky windswept shores uh, and brought me home in many ways um here's how i wrote about it in azorian suite I have been captured by the islands like a cloud caught by a mountain peak, captivated and mesmerized in that original sense of being pulled by a strong magnetic force, pull of my ancestry luring me back. In my dream, I am flying. I am flying in a caravel above an island in the sky. There is no ocean, only sky and my caravel transforms from ship of discovery into a whaling bark. Then, tethered to a sperm whale, we circle our island home. The island is a cloud, or the cloud is an island. Someone fires a cannon, but what is launched is poems, not cannonballs. That's when I wake up. In trying to learn more about the culture of the Azores and to understand my relationship to the culture, I turned to Azorian writers. First, Vitrino Nemezio in the lower uh, left-hand corner there, um, Pedro da Silveira up in the upper upper left-hand, um, also Natalia Correa and Onesimo Almeida. And then others, uh, along with some of my contemporaries, whether uh, native Azorians like Pedro Almeida Maya, um, his book I'm, uh, this book I'm translating, and uh, or or my friend Esmeralda Cabral and her beautiful uh, memoir, How to Clean a Fish and Other Adventures in Portugal. Um, with Nemesio, there was extraordinarily little translated into English, so I had to challenge myself to read him in Portuguese. I was trying to build, learn, learn about his concept of uh, Zorianity, Azoria, Azoria, and Adad, and it, it, you can only really get that and get his, his work in, in, um, in Portuguese. So I'd been working, I started to do some translations of Nemezio's poetry. I shared them with Onesimo Almeida, and he surprisingly thought they were good <laughs> and wanted to publish them in Gavea Brown, a journal that he edits. And while working on the, my memoir in progress, the others in me, which I'm still working on, um, about this, this journey of discovery. I was reading Nemezio's Crosario da Chilish, which is um, uh, his chronicle of, um, uh, of, of travels uh, on the islands and uh, where, he, where he was born, but he had been living in Lisbon. And I, I, it's, it's a funny book, 
it's poignant. Uh, there's some great stories in there. I don't know if half of them are true, but um, uh, it's been, it, it, I, I said to, I wrote to Inesmo, I said, you know, has this been translated into English? Or is there a North American edition planned? Because um, I feel like other Azorian American, North Americans should be reading this book um, to learn, you know, what the Azores were like in the 50s. And um, and he said, no, would you like to give it a try? <laughs> As Onesimo, only Onesimo can. Um, and that sort of set me on this journey. Of course, I, I took the challenge. You can't really say no to Onesimo. Um, um so uh, i've been i've been working on this translation uh for a while now and i continue to translate poems by nemesio as well as poems by pedro da severa and uh, like i said i'm i'm working on now a translation of pedro almeida maya's ilia america uh which is a wonderful book about a stowaway on a cargo plane that left the Azores in the early 60s um and resonates for me in, in part because my i found out that my great grandfather went back to the Azores in the early 60s and to look for his sister that he had, he had left behind. I don't know if I mentioned that he came alone. He left his entire family on the Azores and came alone at the age of 19. Um, so um, uh, so I said, I think I've said um, that I have been back to the islands seven times now since 2018. Um, in the spring of 2022, I went back to San Miguel uh, after COVID had kept us away for a year and a half, um, I lectured at the University of the Source. Actually, a lot of um, this uh, talk tonight uh, is is based on, on that lecture. And then with my dear friend and colleague, Leonor Sampaio Silva, we launched in person my book, Azorian Suite, which had come out two years before, uh, and Wine Dark Sea, my latest book. Um, and I visited with my 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 cousin Victor Keshkiu, who is is the gentleman, very dapper as 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 all the Keshkiu's are. Um, I'm come come to find out, and also very into horses, like my great grandfather was. He has a, a, a this carriage in and horse um, are his. Uh, he he runs the um, tourists up and down um, the waterfront in Ponte Lagada. Um, and uh, it, he he's it's been remarkable because I you know I had no idea I had family there. Um, I've been able to show Victor uh, and his family um, the, our common ancestor and uh, how we're related, and uh, also all the way back uh, in the family history, which which he really didn't know much about. Um, so he's welcomed me into this his his family and this beautiful family and we see we see them every time we go it's my my azorian family and it's a wonderful wonderful relationship um that i can't i couldn't live without now uh, i can't imagine uh what it would be like towards the end of that trip in spring of 2022 i had determined to pay respects to my great grandparents by installing a plaque with their names uh, at Emigrant Square. I actually bought this plaque in 2020, as you see on the plaque there, um, but COVID kept us away, so we hadn't uh, installed it. And uh, my friend uh, Hui uh, Faria um, kept it um, in storage. And then when I arrived, uh, I was able to install it. And we had the uh, entire Keshkiu, uh, some of the uh, Keshkiu family come, uh, which was pretty amazing. Um, and then last fall, uh, I was back again, to present my translation of Pedro da Severo's first book, The Island and the World, at um, the centennial celebration uh, of, of the poet. Um, and I also had the distinct pleasure of having Margarita Valdegato's uh, translation of my book, Dwelling, presented in Lisbon at FLAD, the uh, Fundacion Luso American uh, Development uh, Foundation, and who sponsored the translation by Nuno Judic. So an incredible honor, but also bringing me a full circle on this 25 year journey from the time that I was inspired by Nuno's reading of his poems in Portuguese in New York in 1994 uh, to have him present my work and so eloquently uh, uh, describe it um, uh, to the audience. So we were back again earlier this month 
um, our seventh trip in five years. And this time we visited Tessera, which is Tunisia's family's island, home island. Um, our third island, which is appropriate given its name. Um, and it was our first trip to, to that island. And I was able to pay homage to, to Vitorino Nemezio and his hometown of Praia da Victoria. Um, again, it's been a remarkable journey. Um, and I'm going to close with these words from Azorian Suite. That will give you a sense of uh, the saudade that I feel, which I understand from Rui uh, Faria that is not just about longing, it's also about uh, when you'll when we'll see each other again. My sense of myself is growing, emerging, the more I connect with this island and my heritage here. How did I live so long without this connection, without the connections to family and friends I've made here? 56 years without it, but now I can't let go. My roots grow deeper with each visit. My longing digs into my heart, each time I leave, my own saudades de terra gripping my heart and soul, as if fate, too, has grabbed a hold and opened up my heart to a home I never knew I had. It sounds sentimental, I know, and I'm usually more cynical or at least skeptical, but it does feel like home, and there is no use resisting this iron island siren's call. I'm no Odysseus. These days, I might add, or maybe I am. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate it very, very much. And I'm sure our students and those who are following us appreciate it as well. Appreciate this, the, uh, the, the, this trajectory that uh, uh, got you into the Azores in this case, uh, and lots of different applause going up, as you can see there. And so, um, uh, just a quick, a few questions, and if any of the students have any questions, we, I know that they they're following along with their work pattern. But if you have any questions, students, just put them on the chat. Those of you on social media do that as well. Like I'm trying to track, but we're on different groups. It's kind of hard to do that. But uh, mm -hmm. real quick, uh, you can go ahead and I don't know if you have anything else to share. But if you want to, Scott, we can go ahead. I think I'll that. just have. Um, I'll leave this screen up in case people want to find out where to there where there to find out more. I, that's right. That's actually a good thing. I had that actually up, and that's, I'm glad you brought it up because I had <laughs> I had a link to it to to uh, to bring up. So okay. uh, yeah, if you want to know any more about uh, Scott's books, there they are, um, and uh, in all of the books, and especially the last two, um, especially of course the Azorian Suite, but not just the Azorian Suite. Also, Wine Dark Sea has some translations that Scott did of other poets and has, you know, a connection to the Azores and to Portugal and to his roots as well. So, but um, would, uh, um, uh, here's a question here. Uh, how did you find the census showing your great grandfather migration? How did you track that down? How was that? Of a, of a, of yeah, a, that was um... a process. It was it was interesting because, like I said, I had I had a, I had one address where I knew they had lived, and um, and that was in East Providence, and I was looking, but I was looking for the I had the wrong name, so I was looking for the wrong name in this place, and but once so once I had the Keshkiu name, I was able to unlock everything, because I had a I had the I think it was the nineteen 1940 census that had him situated in East Providence and it showed it, 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 it gave a date for his emigration, like when he came to America. Um, it didn't give the, 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 the month, but it, it said 1906. So I was like, okay, 1906. Um, let me, let me go back what's the latest what's the earliest census i can have that's close to 1906 it was like the 1910 census it was interesting because there were censuses censuses done by the federal government then every other year that when that when that wasn't being done it was done by uh uh the state mm -hmm. so there were there was the state of rhode island had a census and the state and the u.s census and I was able to like kind of triangulate in a way, like isolate where and follow the pattern of where they were. And in fact, one of the 
the U.S. Census and the Rhode Island Census, the earliest ones I had, both had different different surnames, and but it was the same address and it was the same group of people. And so one said Kishkiyu, and the other one said, or some variation of Kishkiyu, and the other one said Perry. And I was, and so I went, I looked at the census, I compared the two census documents, and they had changed the names of all of the Portuguese families to English sounding names. So it was bizarre. Like the Cabrals were, were, um, cable or something like that you know it was it was a strange thing and then it went back with the u.s census to the original names so it was a very strange it was very hard to piece together but once i had that then i also on one of the on one of the census documents um they had recorded the ship name um uh, and the arrival date um and i was able to get the ship manifest for both of the ships and and find them and identify them um which was just i mean again it just started unlocking these things and then i found um one document that had it in addition to le- listing saint michael because that's what they called uh, san miguel um it said <laughs> fjc or yeah something fdc fdc and i was like fdc what is that what is that and i asked somebody on the genealogy listserv who said oh that's probably the parish that w- if it's on saint michael that would be fajasima faja de sima fdc and i was like oh my god so then i knew which parish they were from on the island and once i had that that unlocked the records in the azores because all the census documents all the um all the uh the, the birth certificates, the marriage records, everything was kept at the parish level. So I, I once I had that, the parish, it, and all of that stuff was digitized, which was amazing. These that the 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 document that I showed of my 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 um, great grandmother's birth uh, baptismal record was digitized. Was online. I was able to get PDF, make PDFs of all of this stuff, and kind of piece it together. Uh, it was really really remarkable. Yeah, it is a great experience to do that, especially did that did did do also a that, bit of a rabbit hole. So <laughs> oh, <laughs> you can yeah. just keep going. <laughs> That's that 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 is so true. I w- um, and, and just for our students and and also those who are here locally, um, at, uh, to our own horn here at the Fresno State Library. It, it, I mean, all libraries, of course, have uh, the. Uh, the work that was done by um, uh, Georges Fouchage, which is uh, the history of the names of the three different uh, districts, because as uh, the students know, uh, we talked about that, the district of Ponta Delgada, which included San Miguel and and, and Santa Maria, and then the district of uh, Terceira, which in, or Angra, which included the central part of the archipelago, and then uh, not all of it, but it, then it included uh, Terceira, San Jorge, and Graciosa, and the district of Forta, which included Fayal, Pico, and Flores and Corvo. Mm-hmm. And Fujaj has done an excellent work. I, I was just the other day at Fresno State, and I had uh, uh, not really free time, but I made it to be free time to do something I've always wanted to do, which was a look at my at, at the names from Terceira. So mm-hmm. my name, Dinesh, my first name, uh, I've always known as my grandmother's last name. And I knew her, of course, quite well. I knew her until I was 14. Um, and then uh, she passed when I was 16 and she used to tell me stories about her parents or her mom and dad and her grandparents, okay, which had still some distant relationship with Vitorino de Mezio. But anyway, so I went back and through the names and I, so I have my grandmother's name and I have mm-hmm. her parents' names and her grandparents' names. So it would be my great grandparents and my great, great grandparents. I was able to go back to my original, which uh, was uh, by the name of, of Manuel Vaz who arrived from Melintejo and who mm. married in 1598 and Isabel Lucas, and then a second marriage um, to Isabel Goulart da Silveira. And so he mm. is my first 
uh, person in the island, 1598. So we're talking about a hundred and some odd years after the island was populated. And, mm. and, and, and it's fascinating. And those students who are following, who are a Portuguese background who want to do that, it's not, I mean, you have to know a little bit of Portuguese, obviously, but it's not that hard once you have names, because then you just go back and they say son of this and, and daughter yes. of this. Yes, yeah. And, and it, because it, they stay, because they were from, they, they didn't move around. So Correct. they were in they were in one one parish one village uh, for generations, Correct. you know. And, and in fact, my my cousins the Kashkiers still live in Fushasima. <laughs> I mean, there's the you know they're they're, they're so so that their my family history there is still is still there. You know, it's still you know obviously part of part of my part of that family left, but some of them are still there. So it's it's amazing when you really start to. And they didn't tend to intermarry very much, and certainly not between the islands, but not even even between parishes or or villages on the island. They, they weren't. I mean, the islands are not very big, but it was difficult to get around. Uh, you didn't so you with know. your own parish or the neighboring one or two parishes over. Right. So, right. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, there is some intermingling between Fajusima and Fajusbaishu you know in my family so <laughs> but if you go back further they are they are they are spread out more uh they just tended to concentrate after a period of time um and even when they moved to the states they concentrated in a particular area so so the kishkius followed they were they were sponsored by um uh my my great grandfather was sponsored by a cousin who who lived in fox point in providence uh which which is um uh now more of a cape verdean neighborhood but at the time it was very heavily uh sal miguel uh azurian even down to the parish level people were were living next door to each other or in the same apartment building or you know what have you so indeed indeed well scott um our time is just about up with our students because uh, they uh the class ends now at, uh, uh and then they have, of course, other classes to attend, as you may recall when we were, but we're just, we have a little bit more time, just a couple, few more minutes. But I wanted to ask you just one very quick question. How important has the writing and the translation been for you as a way to discover and to have a better connection with your ancestors as an addition to this scouting that you did and this research and you know, there's lots and lots of people uh, that uh, get involved in, of course, trying to, you know, research for their roots. And um, even in our class, we have students who are of third, fourth, or just a quarter, or not even Portuguese at all, but they're interested, of course, in the Azorian and the Azorian American experience. As mm -hmm. an Azorian American and, you know, of uh, basically fourth generation, um, do, you, um, do you find that Two things you find that the writing and the translation how is how is that focused uh, how is that played uh, mm -hmm. an important part or not and of course yeah. uh, in finding your writing and the other second part of the question was uh, you know you've been there five or six times or seven times in the last few years um, how important are these visits what what did they bring to you uh, that you if had you not gone back. Would you have this same experience? Mm, mm, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, so one of my one of my great teachers, uh, writing teachers, was uh, the poet Gary Snyder, uh, a beat generation poet uh, from the West Coast, and he said, "I, I, I just love this quote, um, and I, I sort of live by it." That uh, he said, "I I don't write because I have something to say; I write to understand what I'm thinking." So for me writing about this is trying to understand it trying to understand what does it mean to me why does it feel so important why did i feel like i was missing something like i really felt like there was a hole in my heart you know that had to be filled by this history and not having access to that history not having i still don't really have access to the history i have i have data I have I, I have speculation. I can I can start to understand in part by going there, certainly um, what their lives may have been like, um, but also by reading, by translating, by learning some of the, the, the history and what what life was like uh, for for them at that time or going back my ancestors. Another 
Um, I mean, I, I can't stop going back. I, it was funny because when we arrived this time uh, at customs, uh, the guy the, the guy at customs said, oh, this is not your first trip here. And I said, no. I said, it's actually my seventh. He said, have you bought a house yet? <laughs> he, said, <laughs> he, said, he said, they say that after the fourth trip, they buy a house. <laughs> and I said, no, not yet, not yet, not yet. But um, no, I feel like it's um, each time I go, my connection deepens and I learn more about the island. I explore, I see more, I start to, uh, I feel closer to it. Um, uh, I, I, you know, it, it's, it's, it's become a very important part of my life and, um, and in my identity of who I am. Um, and I guess it's sort of, I'm sort of like a zealot in that way that, you know, I didn't have it for most of my life and now I do. So I'm like, oh, I'm, so, I'm, 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 uh, passionate about it. I'm telling, you know, when I, I tell people about it, uh, you know, um, I'm, and trying to get people to come and see it. Uh, for themselves uh you know it, it's a deep passion um i do need to do some exploration on the mainland um uh, uh some more um to get even further back in my family history but the azores will always be i think now that i've found them uh a really important place for me yeah uh, indeed and and we have uh, one of our attendees on there was a question about the um uh, i want to learn a bit a bit more about sponsors uh, were they required? And Kathy adds, um, I don't think that they were required. Many people I know say, oh, my family came the right way. And they had a sponsor. That's sometimes a code word for, you know, trying to put a political point on to our political spin on today's. Uh, immigrants. Oh, oh, but, oh. Uh, yeah, well, I, actually, th I think I, I do the think they had to have I, they I had that, to have a place of re they had to have a place they were going to. And so um, they couldn't just arrive and have no, you know, no, no, no. So I don't know if sponsor is the right word, although they did refer to them as sponsors. But they did um, have to have sponsors after the immigration, well, which wouldn't be your great grandpa's case. Right. But they, we did, for example, when my mom and dad came over, we had sponsors. Mm -hmm. we had to have, it wasn't a sponsor in the aspect. So in the 1960s, the Family Unification Act you could ask, you could petition, it was a petition, to mm -hmm. bring your family over, but mm -hmm. they also had to show the U.S. consulate in Ponte Delgada uh, mm -hmm. a letter of uh, intent to of employment, of a sponsorship. So in other okay. words, if yeah. something happened that this person would be able to either get you a job or try to um, or try to find work for you. But indeed, mm -hmm. in your and my grandfather's case, because my grandfather came over in 1910, so very close to you, mm -hmm. so family. Um, um, anybody could come over. You just have, to, but you you did have to, to have an address where you were going to. I yes, think yes. Fired that a little bit. You know? Yeah, and they yeah, and it and there had to be a name attached to that address because you can just be a random address. But it was um yeah, and I think. I mean, some of the, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know that, um, I, I know that at a certain point, um, you couldn't leave, um, if you were 18 as a, as a man, uh, the, the, the 18 year olds couldn't leave because they had to serve in the military. Um, and then you could actually pay someone to take your place. Now that wouldn't have been my great grandfather, um, but. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, yeah, he's, he's yeah, and it's interesting because it showed how much they had in the census in the um, in the uh, ship uh, manifest. It it noted how much money they had on hand, and it was basically the equivalent of five dollars. So not a lot. I mean, but he did, probably didn't have much to begin with. He ended up um, getting a job with Narragansett Electric Lighting Company as a bricklayer. And he built um, the. Uh, uh, he worked for them for from 1912 to 1946, I think. And he built the coal-fired uh, fired power plant in in um, across from Fox Point. That's now now houses the Brown University administrative offices and the Rhode Island School of Nursing. So I've been to that building and touched the bricks and thought, 
my great grandfather may have placed one of these bricks. I mean, he may, you know, he may have worked on this wall. I don't know. You know, it's really, it's really uh, quite moving. So, indeed. And uh, just answer you also, Kathy's point. Indeed, Kathy, I think there's uh, some work to be done on that. I do think that we need to kind of look at that. The idea of sponsor before the 1965 Immigration Act. The idea of sponsor after, uh, because indeed I think that. Um, uh, Kathy points out in uh, 1921, the Immigration Act of 1921 was brutal. Yes. Okay? Brutal, yeah. towards, brutal towards Portugal, brutal towards all Southern Europeans. Okay. Right, um, right. So there was a very discriminatory. Correct, correct. The, and there was a, obviously a cap. For another yeah. discussion, but yeah, it was a cap. Very, yeah, they put a cap. Very discriminatory against the Southern Europeans, uh, of which the Portuguese, of course, were included. Mm -hmm. uh, but indeed, it, it's a wonderful trajectory. Uh, Scott, I'm, uh, uh, of course, we're all fortunate for this finding of yours, not only in the, uh, uh, you know, in, in tracing uh, back and making these family connections, which you've made in San Miguel, you know, these uh, second, third, and, and fourth cousins, but also, you know, finding your way as a voice uh, in the Zorian literature, because as I try to tell the students at Fresno State, um, you can be a Zorian without ever stepping your foot in the Azores. And we see that. And as I always quote that wonderful line from, you had a picture there of you and, and our good friend, the young man, uh, Christovan, who is a wonderful singer, folk singer, which yes. is like for the Azorian cultural class. And I'll never forget that one event that we kind of launched, the Kagahu Colloquium that you baptized. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you read, and I believe uh, Sam read, and a few other poets, Lara. That's right, that's right. A few other poets that read. And at the end, before his last song, he said, are you sure you guys have never been? I know <laughs> The rest of you have never been to the Azores. Are you sure you're not from here? Because you're talking about themes that are very important to us. They're very uh, much who we are. And it seems like even when they don't get passed on from generation to generation. Which it's, come, it's in the DNA. Like yeah. Esmeralda said, it's it's intergenerational saudade. It gets passed on even though you they don't speak about it. Okay. There was a wonderful quote that Pedro Amea Maya shared with me. Uh, recently by um, Maria de Grasa uh, Camara, uh, said to be a, an Asorian it is necessary to be born here or live life to know how to die here. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, Scott, thank you very much, so much. Thanks to all the Thanks to the community members as well. Thanks to all of you on social media outlets. Again, and here's the information, and we'll be talking about it in our class as well with our students. Again, uh, thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate it. Best of luck, and continue, continue on onward with your Azorianess in um, in in your own writing, and of course in your translation. Thanks for all the translation work that you're doing. Take care, everyone. Yeah. Appreciate. It. All right.